When you've completed this lesson, you should be able to apply the Pythagorean theorem to solve problems and use trigonometry functions and their inverses and know when to apply them to solve problems. Photonics technicians need to use trigonometric functions. The famous Pythagorean theorem is related to that because it has right triangles in it and it's very useful for solving optics problems. In addition, you're going to use several trigonometry functions to solve optics problems, such as the sine function, the cosine function, and the tangent function. Now, on your calculator, you may recognize those as SIN, COS, and TAN. So you may have wondered what those functions were. Today, you're going to learn about how to use them to solve problems. You've already encountered some of these functions in previous modules. For example, Snell's Law of Refraction, which says index of refraction 1 times the sine of theta 1 is equal to n2 times the sine of theta 2. So you may have already used that function. Now you'll learn how to relate it to right triangle geometry. For example, the U.S. astronauts back in the early space program placed a one square meter retroreflector on the surface of the moon that was designed to reflect back a large percentage of all of the light that struck it coming from the Earth, for example, a laser beam. If scientists were to point a laser with a beam divergence of 1.35 milliradians at that panel, and the Earth is about 4 times 10 to the 8 meters away from the moon, what is the laser beam's diameter when it reaches the moon? And if the laser emits a huge beam with a 50 joule pulse in one microsecond, that would be 5 times 10 to the 7th watts, what power per unit area will strike the panel? And what solid angle does that lunar reflector panel present to the laser back to the scientists on Earth? Well, let's review some of the trig skills that are involved in solving this problem before we actually tackle these questions. Let's look at some right triangle terminology. Right triangles contain a right angle, that is, a 90 degree angle. You've seen that before, and you've learned about right triangles in the previous modules. The right angle is formed by the two legs of the triangle. And the side opposite the right angle is always the longest of the three sides, and it's known as the hypotenuse. And you'll probably remember the Pythagorean theorem and its formula, where we have the sum of the two legs squared equals the hypotenuse squared, better known as a squared plus b squared equals c squared. This mathematical relationship between the three sides of the right triangle is very, very useful. Let's look at example one now, an example of using the Pythagorean theorem to solve a problem. Your car odometer shows that you drove 1.8 miles up a very straight road up a long hill all the way from sea level. At the top of the hill, there's a sign that says you are now one mile above sea level. Well, it's probably hard to imagine this really happening, but let's just say for the sake of the problem that it could really happen. How far did you travel horizontally in order to get one mile above sea level after driving 1.8 miles? Well, let's draw a sketch of the problem. When you're working on geometry problems, you should always draw a sketch. And so we can see that we drove up the road 1.8 miles and rose one mile during that drive. So what we like to find is how far do we drive horizontally. We'll notice that leg 2 is 1.0 miles, and the hypotenuse, which is C, is 1.8 miles. And so we can use the Pythagorean theorem to solve for A. We have A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And if we substitute in the values for B and C and square them and solve for A, which would means we'll subtract the 1 mile squared on to the right side, we'll have 3.24 square miles and one square mile. So we subtract those two, 2.24 square miles, and take the square root of both sides, and we'll find that A is 1.5 miles. And so we traveled 1.5 miles inland in order to get to the top of that hill. 
Now here's an interesting fact that the text points out that we'll spend just a minute or two on. The Pythagorean theorem has been known universally and has fascinated men for centuries as a squared plus b squared equals c squared. There's a very interesting relationship between those three numbers. One interesting and often useful fact that you can use because you can remember them easily is the presence of three integers that happen to work out perfectly for the Pythagorean theorem. Those are called Pythagorean triples. You're, the most famous is the 3-4-5 triangle. For example, you know that a 3-foot by 4-foot triangle has a hypotenuse that is 5 feet long. So that's very useful when you're framing and constructing things, or if you want to verify that something is a right angle, you can simply measure out 3 feet and 4 feet on the two sides and see whether it's 5 feet between the two points that you've measured. Now, there's actually quite a few Pythagorean triples. Here are 16 primitive Pythagorean triples for under 100 that have less than 100 as the C value. Uh, there's also integer multiples of each of these, which will also be a triple, but they would not be considered what we call primitive. For example, 3, 4, 5 is a primitive Pythagorean triple, but we can multiply each of those by 2 and have 6, 8, 10, and that's also a Pythagorean triple. There are lots of Pythagorean triples, even under C less than 100, uh, but we've just shown 16 of the primitive ones here. Okay, let's look at example two, a real world problem where we're needing to find the distance between two pulleys that are nine inches apart horizontally and six inches apart vertically, as shown in the little sketch here. So what we need to do is find the distance between their centers. So right again, let's draw a little sketch here and label it, and we'll see that we have six inches vertically and nine inches horizontally. Those are the two legs of our triangle, and we can use the Pythagorean theorem very quickly to solve for C, the diagonal distance there. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. We'll substitute in the six inches and the nine inches, square the two values, and add them together. And you can see that we'll have to take the square root of both sides to solve for C, and we'll have 10.8 inches is the distance between those two pulleys. Now, angles have a special relationship in right triangles as well. And we'll look at that. So suppose we have a triangle that's labeled ABC, then the angles inside them are also angles A, B, and C. And for angle A, we'll notice that there are some conventions that we need to learn. The side opposite angle A is known as side A and the leg opposite A. The side that's next to angle A, that's not the hypotenuse, is this leg that's adjacent to angle A. And it's usually known as B because it'll be opposite B. The hypotenuse is C. And then there's the important trigonometric ratios that you must learn that are related to that convention and that description. So if we have the tangent of angle A is equal to the ratio of the length of side opposite A and the side adjacent to A. And you'll notice that we abbreviate that as OPP for opposite and ADJ for adjacent. There's a ratio known as the sine of the angle A. And that will be the ratio of the length of the side opposite A to the hypotenuse of that right triangle. So if we have three sides of this triangle and we have this angle A, then the sine is known as the ratio of the length of this side of the triangle divided by the length of the hypotenuse, opposite over HYP, abbreviation for hypotenuse. And lastly, we have the cosine ratio, which is, as you probably guessed, the ratio of the side adjacent to angle A divided by the hypotenuse. So you can see that we've got that triangle pretty well covered. So we have the ratio of the legs, we have the ratio of the opposite leg to the hypotenuse, and the ratio of the adjacent leg to the hypotenuse. That pretty much covers it for angle A. Now let's look at the use of that in a real world example. Suppose we have a car's rear window which is slanted up and we can measure how far it rises and how far it runs over that same distance. So if we can measure the rise is 10 and a half inches and the run of 12 inches, we need to find the angle that the window makes with the vertical. First of all, we're going to be asked to sketch the triangle formed, B, calculate the value of the tangent of the angle, we're going to use our calculator's inverse tangent function to find the angle measure. 
First of all, we need to always make a sketch and label it around with what we've got. So we can see that we've got the glass is playing the role of our hypotenuse in this triangle. And the two legs are 12 inches on this side and 10 and a half on this side. And here's the angle that we're trying to find. So where's the opposite side for this angle? Well, 12.0 inches will be the opposite and 10.5 will be the adjacent. So when we know the opposite and the adjacent, what ratio is this a clue that we probably will be using? Right, the tangent function, because the tangent equals the ratio of the lengths of the opposite side divided by the adjacent side. You're going to remember those ratios, right? So we set up our relationship that the tangent of g is equal to the opposite over the adjacent, divide 12 by 10.5, and we can calculate that in our calculator as it comes out to 1.14286. Now that we know that the tangent ratio is, we can do just the opposite of the tangent and use what we call the inverse tangent. We can always look in a table or a calculator. For example, in olden days, when I grew up, we had tables of tangents for all these angles, and we would say, okay, if our tangent was 1.14, then we would probably have to come up and down here and try to find an angle value that was close to that tangent. Well, we live in the modern era now where we have calculators that can have all these tables built right into them. We can find, for example, that in the table, the tangent of 40 is 0.84. Conversely, when we know the value of the tangent, we can find the angle that would produce that ratio using the inverse tangent function. So if we know it's 0.84, then we can look over here and see, ah, the angle must be 40. In this case, we have our ratio is 1.14286, and so we can look in our table and can we see 1.14? Well, we don't have it, so we're going to use our calculator function instead. The inverse tangent function of the tangent will give us that angle and the inverse tangent function of 1.14286, the ratio from our previous slide, is 48.8 degrees if we round it. That looks like it's somewhere right between 45 and 50 on our table. So the calculators made it a lot easier for us that we didn't have to go through any interpolation process using our table. So we could say that the glass makes an angle of about 49 degrees with the vertical. Let's see how to actually do that on a calculator. Some calculators have to be configured as to be either in degrees or radian mode, especially the TI-80 series. So be sure your calculator is in degree mode, and you'll find out real quick if it's not. Assuming we're in degrees mode, let's find, for example, the value of tangent of 30. If we look on our table, the tangent of 30 should give us what? 0.5735. Let's see whether we get that. So on the TI-80 series, you'd press tangent, key in 30, and press enter and you should get the result. On a TI-30 series, you have to push the numbers in first and then press the tangent function. In either case, hopefully your calculator knows that the tangent is actually 0.57735 and it probably has even more digits out there that will give you even more precision. Now, conversely, let's find the inverse tangent. To do that on a TI-80 series, press the second tangent and if you'll notice the label right above the tangent key, it will be labeled tan to the minus 1, or tangent inverse. As before, you enter the value of 0.7 and press enter, and you should get the result. And if you press 0.7 on the TI-30 series, and then press inverse tangent, you should get the same result. About 0.7 from our table would tell us that we should be getting about 35 degrees, right? So now, can you find the answer to our problem, which was the tangent inverse of 12.0 divided by 10.5? Here's another real-world example. Suppose a manufacturer recommends between 65 and 80 degrees for the angle that your ladder makes with the ground. Any steeper than 80 degrees is dangerous, and any less than 65 degrees is dangerous. So you plan to position your 24-foot ladder three feet away from the wall. Surely that's uh, about the looks like the right angle. Well, let's see whether it really is or not. We can do that with our trigonometry. So we need to find the maximum and minimum base distances for safe use and then compare that to the three foot distance that we're planning to use. First, as always, make a sketch of the geometry of the situation. We have our angle B in our triangle is the angle that the ladder makes with the ground. 
and that's supposed to be between 65 and 80 degrees. We have our 24 foot ladder standing up top of the wall and we have adjacent to that angle is three feet how far the ladder is away from the wall. Now knowing the adjacent and the hypotenuse lengths of the triangle means we can calculate the cosine ratio. Remember that? So when the 24 foot ladder is three foot from the wall the cosine of that angle B will be equal to the adjacent length divided by the hypotenuse length which in our case is three feet divided by 24 feet. Feet will cancel and we'll have a ratio of 0.125 so now what angle would give a cosine of 0.125? To do that we'll have to use the inverse cosine function. So we press inverse cosine of the value for cosine B which we know is 0.125 and the cosine inverse of 0.125 equals 82.8 degrees rounded. Unfortunately, this is outside the recommended range of 65 degrees to 80 degrees, so we must conclude that our three-foot ladder placement is unsafe because it produces an unsafe angle, too steep. So it means it's too close to the wall. So we're going to have to move it back away a little bit in order to get less than 80 degrees. So what distances would be safe? Well, let's just work that problem the other way then. We know the hypotenuse and the angle values, and we need to find the adjacent side length. Again, we'll use the cosine ratio. So we'll set up the ratios for the minimum and the maximum angles and solve for that unknown adjacent length. So the adjacent length in this case would be 24 feet times 0.4226 is the cosine of 65 degrees. We know that'll be the maximum distance because that's when the ladder is laying almost flat, right? 10.1 feet would be the answer we get for the farthest distance away from the wall that we should have that ladder. Okay, so now let's look at the other extreme. If 80 degrees, the cosine of 80 is equal to the adjacent side divided by 24. And we'll solve for the adjacent, and that will be 24 times the cosine of 80, which is 0.1736. And that evaluates to 4.24 feet. So our ladder could be as close as 4.2 feet and but no farther than 10.1 feet but unfortunately three feet is just too close. Now let's return to our opening scenario with that laser and the retroreflector on the moon that's four times 10 to the eighth meters away that's 400 million meters away that's a long ways and the laser beam divergence of theta equals 1.35 milliradians not a very large divergence so maybe that laser beam is not too big when it gets there. And the laser output of 5 times 10 to the 7th watts, 50 megawatts. All right, so let's look, find first the beam diameter when it reaches the moon. As always, let's make a sketch of the geometry. So we've got the Earth and the moon, and the beam is spreading with an angle theta. And we'll label those coordinates of those points as A, B, C, and D. You'll notice that we have a triangle that's ABC. That, let's just look at that triangle. And we have, that in that case, the angle A in the triangle is actually half of theta. So we'll say that's theta over 2. And the adjacent side, which is the distance from the Earth to the Moon, is AC. So we'll, we know an angle, which is theta over 2, and we have an adjacent side. Ah, that should begin to tell you something. So we're trying to find the beam spread, D, as it reaches the moon. And so the opposite side of our triangle is going to be half of the beam spread. That will be half D. So we need to find what BC is. So the tangent of the angle theta over 2 is going to equal the opposite side divided by the adjacent side. Now we know the adjacent side and we know the angle, but we don't know the opposite. So we're going to have to solve for the opposite. We can substitute in the angle that we know, which is 1.35 milliradians divided by 2. We don't know what the BC is, and we'll divide by the adjacent side, which is the Earth to Moon distance. And we solve for BC, and we'll multiply those numbers out. The result will be 2.7 times 10 to the fifth meters, better known as 270 kilometers. That's a pretty wide spot on the Moon, because twice of that which is the diameter of the spot, is going to be 540 kilometers. 
So that's pretty huge compared to that tiny little one square meter reto reflector. Now, assuming all the laser's power actually reaches the moon, now spread over a circular spot that is a diameter of 540 kilometers, we can calculate what the power per unit area is on the surface of the moon. That'll be the incident power divided by the area of the spot, which is going to be pi over 4 times the diameter. So we substitute in our values of 5 times 10 to the 7th watts and pi over 4 times our diameter, 540 kilometers squared, and we'll have 2.2 times 10 to the minus 4 watts per square meter. And finally, the power that will strike that little one square meter panel after traveling 4 times 10 to the 8th meters is carried by a solid angle that we can calculate as the area divided by the distance that it travels squared. If you'll remember back to our geometry unit, we talked about the solid angles. That'll be 1 meter squared divided by the distance 4 times 10 to the 8th meters squared, and that'll evaluate out to 6 times 10 to the minus 18th steradians. That's a pretty small angle. Now we'll look at some practice exercises where you can have a chance to practice some of these. Uh, as usual, we'll not solve every one of the problems, just enough to kind of get your taste buds wet and give you some confidence that you can solve the rest of those. First of all, we have a, an application of the Pythagorean theorem in a kind of unusual way. We have an electronics, an impedance equation that says z squared is equal to r squared plus x squared, where z is the impedance of a circuit, r is the electrical resistance of the circuit, and x is the reactance. All of these things measured in ohms. Well, that looks a lot like the Pythagorean theorem, doesn't it? So we can look at graphically how that might be similar to the Pythagorean theorem. Recall the right triangle in the Pythagorean theorem has a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Or we can turn that around so that it looks like our problem, c squared equals a squared plus b squared. In which case, the hypotenuse is played by the role of the impedance, and the two legs are played by the role of the resistance R and the reactance X. Now, given a loudspeaker that has an impedance of 8 ohms and you measure its resistance to be 1.5 ohms, can we find the speaker's reactance? Well, it's simply a matter of the application of Pythagorean theorem and solving for the unknown x in this case. So we'll substitute in the values for the overall impedance is 8 ohms, the resistance is 1.5 ohms, and we need to solve for x. So we'll insert the values and square them and solve for x by taking the square root of both sides, and that'll be 7.9 ohms rounded. Okay, well now let's look at exercise 3. The illustration here gives you shows you a 3-foot minimum extension above the top landing for a safe ladder use. So this is a little like the problem we saw in the example. In this case, we're going to be more realistic and say that a ladder has to at least extend three feet above the top where you step off. So here again, we have a 24-foot ladder. And using the illustration's guidelines, we can find the distance to the top support A. It's clearly 24 feet minus three feet equals 21 feet. Now notice that the illustration is talking about the distance from the vertical, like we had from the distance from the wall in our example. Here, they're showing that They'd like it to be one-fourth the distance up the ladder on the top support. So let's draw a sketch of our situation where we have a triangle with the hypotenuse is A, and we have the vertical distance H, and the leg of our triangle is one-fourth A, according to our drawing. So we have the Pythagorean theorem that says the one-fourth A squared plus the H squared will equal the hypotenuse squared, or a in this case. So we can solve for h, so that's going to be a squared minus 1 16th a squared, which we can then realize is that's just 15 16ths a squared. We're still working algebraically here. But now we can go ahead and substitute in the value for a, which is 21 feet. Take 15 16ths of 21 feet squared. Take the square root of it, and that'll be 20.33 feet. 
Okay, well that concludes our treatment of Module 10, Trigonometry for Photonics for Mathematics Education. I know we've given you a lot of stuff there, but hopefully that'll give you some confidence to go on and finish the rest of those exercises and solve the problems that you encounter in your photonics career. We'll see you next time. Thank you.